Good morning. Welcome to Belmont Watertown United Methodist Church. I'm so happy to see so many people out here, although there are some way back there. I invite you all to come forward. There are a few seats available. <clears throat> uh, oh, but that's right. You're good Methodists. You have to sit in the back. Got to cover it all. <laughs> uh, in case you haven't noticed, I am not Gary Richards. I'm clean shaven. <laughs> I'm Nancy Wickman. I am a pastoral candidate, which means Methodist Church is about to uh, punish me by making me a pastor somewhere. So, um, so for right now, I'm just filling in for Gary while he's off doing something. Um, hopefully, somebody will be doing something like this for me someday. Um, again, welcome. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. I grew up in a Presbyterian church with a pastor who believed that the surest path to faith was through doubt. And I uh, thought it would be good to start a service with a little bit of open space and let the Lord fill it. This is a song called, I Know, which of course, I don't. Been a carpenter like Jesus, been a preacher like Paul, been a fisherman like Peter, been a liar like Saul. I've been all around this old world, been uptown and down. I know where I've been, I don't know where I'm found. I know, yes I know. I don't know We say life is a river That's carrying me home Well I am the river So where can I go Time is a fire That's burning me alive I am the fire Still unsatisfied I know Yes I know I don't know I keep rolling Along And say Like Jesus, been a preacher like Paul, been a fisherman like Peter, been a liar like Saul. I've been all around this old world, been uptown and down. I know where I've been, I don't know where I'm found. I know, yes, I know. as well move on All I have are puzzles I might have them wrong I'll take my puzzles my questions and doubts Answers just lock doors I always want out I know Oh I know I don't know Just roll.
me and reading responsibly the call to worship this morning that's printed in your bullet. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, I will say to the Lord, Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. And now please join me in reading in unison the opening prayer. Holy God, you reach out in love through Jesus our Christ, to save us so that we may live as faithful servants of you alone. Unchain us from our desire for wealth and power so that we may, in turn, release others from the prisons of poverty, hunger, and oppression. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is... Majesty, worship His Majesty on page 176 of the United Methodist Hymn. Sometimes 
sets a wake up for us, a an alarm. Forest? God wake wants up. us to wake up and do what God wants us to do, to follow God. And that's kind of like what the story is that we're going to talk about today. There's a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus. A poor man? Poor. <laughs> Means he doesn't have any money. He's kind of like I'm homeless. Poor. I'm poor. <laughs> so. You wouldn't even be going to school. I don't have school. <laughs> Laz Lazarus had no idea what school was. I don't so. know what school is. Lazarus had sores all over his body because he couldn't afford to go to a doctor. You know, it's like when you get an owie. He had them all over. And even though he was laying right at the gate by the rich man's house, the rich man would walk by every day and not even see Lazarus. I don't think owie hurt. So, one day, both Lazarus and the rich man died. And the angels came and took Lazarus up to heaven. But the rich guy, because he had been so nasty during his life, went to hell. What's hell? Hell? All right, go for it. Hell is kind of like school. I never go to school. So... Yeah, well, one day you'll be going to school all day. And that's kind of like hell. What? Unless you really like it. Help? But hell is really, really hot. The Bible tells us it's fire and sulfur, which is really stinky stuff, all the time. And that's where the rich man ended up. The rich man? But the rich man looked up and he saw heaven and he saw Lazarus up there. With Abraham, who is the father of our faith. And he said, Abraham, send him down here to dip his finger in some cool water and touch it to my tongue to cool me off. He, and he had touched um, hot fire <coughs> attached to your tongue. Mm -hmm. and hot fire, not hot, cold, not cold. Really hot, yep. <gasps> and Abraham said, sorry, I can't do that because there is a big ditch between us. And nobody can get across that ditch because there's no bridge. What's a ditch? And, 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 and I mean, what's a bridge? A bridge? You oh, see yeah. lots oh, yeah. of bridges here in Boston. Wait, there, there's no bridge in how... Wait, what are you even talking about? I don't even get what you're saying. So, <laughs> so the, the point is that God wants to wake us up to the poor people around us, those who are disadvantaged. And to help them while we still can. So that we don't end up in that really, really hot place with the rich man. And so, uh, let's see, I think we're supposed to do the Lord's Prayer. Okay. Can you all join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The scripture lesson this morning begins with the letter of Paul uh, to first, the first letter of Timothy, uh, chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith 
and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Jesus Christ, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time, he who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see to him the honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. And now from the Gospel according to Luke, the 16th chapter, verses 19 to 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted scrumptiously every day. And at the gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Our second hymn, What Does the Lord Require? United Methodist Hymnal number 441. Please stand if you're comfortable.
begin today in the midst of a large crowd that is traveling with Jesus. This crowd includes the disciples, tax collectors, sinners, Pharisees, lawyers, scribes, and us. Recently, Jesus has been telling all these weird parables concerning well-off or rich men. They are about the father who throws a lavish feast for his younger son who squanders his inheritance. The owner of a hundred sheep who goes after the one that strays. The rich man who accuses his slave manager of misusing his property. And today, a rich man who has no compassion for a poor man named Lazarus. The rich man's sumptuous feasting or from the Greek, making merry. Let's see if I can handle this word. Euphrinomonos, from which we get euphoria, which is a whole lot easier to say, also echoes the eat, drink, and be merry, boast of the barn guy in chapter 12 that I believe I shared the last time I was here. In Luke's writings, Jesus often offers substantial advice for people with wealth and social standing. They should not take the VIP seats at feasts. They should invite the poor, the diseased, and the marginalized to their lavish feasts, rather than their elite friends or family who can invite them back. They should consider selling their possessions and redistribute the proceeds to the poor. They are commended for giving half their possessions to the poor and making restitution to those they defrauded. And Jesus shames the rich who offers gifts to the temple from their abundance, while a poor widow gives all she has, trusting in God. Most politicians today claim to focus on the so-called middle class as if the poor don't matter. But Jesus is concerned with the poor, the sick, and the marginalized. As wealth is concentrated in the top 1 to 2 percent of a population, most people live in poverty. Jesus wants to raise the consciousness of the rich about poverty, compassion, and social inequality. It's also helpful to think about the association of material wealth and politics that existed in the Roman Empire, which these writings were written in. For the most part, Riches could only be acquired through continuous collaboration with the Roman administration. So those who were rich usually supported a system that oppressed the vast majority of the people for the benefit of only a few people at the center of the empire. Kind of sounds like the United States. Interestingly, Luke seems less bothered by rich women. So why am I not rich? Some of them were even appreciated as benefactors in early Christianity. Luke mentioned that many women who accompanied Jesus and his 12 disciples provided for them out of their resources. Likewise, Paul drew on the financial support of benefactors for his travels and missionary activities. He had a secretary to whom he could dictate letters. That person was likely paid by Phoebe, who was introduced in Romans 16, as a patroness of Paul and many others, suggesting a person of considerable status and prosperity. It is therefore inappropriate to make a wholesale claim that early Christians criticized material wealth, and we should not do so today. Instead, of, it was of much more crucial importance the attitude of the person who owned it. Material wealth can get in the way of putting one's trust in God, and it can be a hindrance to following Jesus, as we see in the letter to Timothy. <clears throat> Many of the church ministries and services depend on financial resources of those who are willing to share them. I hope that includes most of you. Therefore, Timothy is told that those who have riches are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. With a vivid journey to the afterlife and an exaggerated imagery of contrast, 
This parable fits the form of what is often called an apocalypse or a revelation. An apocalypse serves as a wake-up call, like my alarm clock did this morning. <laughs> Pulling back the curtain to open our eyes to something we urgently need to see before it's too late. Like the dream sequences in Ebenezer Scrooge's, that Ebenezer Scrooge experienced in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. The insatiable appetite for wealth narrows a person's field of vision. When we are transfixed by wealth, we cannot look around at neighbors who can show us that riches are not necessary for an abundant life. Wealth's blinders, like they use on horses, keep us from seeing the people whose need for bare sustenance far, out, far surpasses our desire for newer, better, and more intense satisfactions. During his life, the rich man didn't even see the poor man who was at his gate each day. And by the way, the Greeks suggest that Lazarus was thrown or dumped there. Kind of boggles my mind. Now in the afterlife, he sees Lazarus, but it's too late. The parable portrays a permanent chasm fixed between the rich man, who is way down there, and poor Lazarus, who is way up there, with no way to cross over the castle. The exaggerated contrasts are many. The lavish meals of the rich man's table in life, contrasting with his unquenchable thirst after death. The deathly poverty of Lazarus, contrasting with his rest in the bosom of Abraham, as older translations rendered it. In this gospel, it is usually the people of status who are damned, and the poor are not. Yet in this parable, it is the poor man who is named, and the rich man has lost everything, including his name. As Paul tells Timothy, we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. These contrasts underscore the parable's function as an urgent warning. The image of vindication in Abraham's bosom is a wonderful one. Offering comfort for those in Luke's audience and those in the world today who are as poor as Lazarus. <clears throat> the image of resting in the bosom of Abraham inspired the African American spiritual Rock My Soul in the Bosom of Abraham. I couldn't find the music or we'd be playing it right now. But, <clears throat> but beautiful as this image is, the primary message of this parable is probably not one of comfort. In Martin Luther's day, this parable caused much discussion about where we go when we die. Luther and his contemporaries were concerned about the location of the bosom of Abraham in relation to heaven. And do we go there immediately after death, or do we wait for the resurrection at the last day? This also inspired Luther's critique of purgatory, which Protestants no longer recognize. In a 1523 sermon on this parable, Luther argued the book that the bosom of Abraham was not a place, but the word of God. And he quotes, Thus were all the fathers before the birth of Christ carried into Abraham's bosom. That is, at death they were established in this saying of God, and fell asleep in the same. They were embraced and guarded as in a bosom, and sleep there until the day of judgment. In other words, Luther struggled, in other writings, Luther struggled to clarify the relationship between death as sleep awaiting the last day and the real role of Sheol and the bosom of Abraham in the interim time. As much as I admire Luther, I find myself in disagreement on this subject. My New Testament professor asked one day in class, how far can you push a parable? He was not amused when I said six feet. <laughs> oh, how far can you push a parable? I thought six feet was pretty good. Should we consider parables as helpful fictions that open our imaginations to new possibilities? Or should we approach them as condensed educational pieces designed to carry specific teachings? 
How far should we push? This parable does not explicitly explain why, why the rich man suffers torment in Hades while Lazarus reclines in Abraham's bosom, though one might read verse 25 as such a justification. But I find wealth alone an insufficient reason. Through verse 23, all we know about these characters is that their destinies have been radically reversed. The rich man descends from luxury to suffering while Lazarus is raised from plain, pain to blessedness. Do we push it too far if we speculate that the reason for these changes lies in the opposites of obscene luxury and abject poverty? In this life, Lazarus lays, lays at the gate, lies at the gate. Are there any English teachers in here? Forgive me. <laughs> giving the rich man an opportunity to intercede, while he, which he fails to accept. In the next life, if not in the first, a great chasm separates the two and cannot be crossed. Do we take Jesus seriously when he said, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation? That's from the Sermon on the Plain. The Greek down translated consolation in, in the Sermon on the Mount shares the same root as the word describing Lazarus' comfort here in this passage. At my home church, there are many homeless people around, some of them asking for money. I occasionally talk to some of them. One day a guy told me that he would rather have people tell him no than to just walk by as though he was invisible. Everybody wants to be seen. But the parable was probably not originally intended as a factual explanation of the afterlife. To understand the meaning, we can turn to Abraham's three responses denying the rich man's request to send Lazarus. <clears throat> Abraham is almost pastoral as he refuses each of the rich man's requests. He calls the rich man child, making clear that being a child of Abraham is no guarantee of salvation. For the rich man, it is too late. Abraham will not send Lazarus to help the rich man after death. I often invite people to find themselves in the readings. Where might we find ourselves in this parable? If this parable is an apocalypse, and it certainly looks like one to me, then Luke is situating us not so much in the role of either Lazarus or the rich man, but in the role of the five siblings who are still alive. And here's another Greek word for you. The Greek word adelphoi can include sisters as well as brothers. So siblings is a good translation. The five siblings who are still alive have time to open their eyes. They have time to see the poor people at their gates before the chasm the great separation, becomes permanent. Send Lazarus to them, to them that he might warn them, cries the rich man on behalf of his brothers and sisters, so that they do not come into this place of torment. This terrifyingly vivid apocalyptic journey to Hades awakens a sense of urgency on the part of Luke's audience, and hopefully us. We are those five siblings of the rich man, we who are still alive have been warned about our urgent situation. We have Moses and the prophets. We have the scriptures. We have the manna lessons of God's economy, about God's care for the poor and the hungry. We even have someone who has risen from the dead and who explains Moses and the prophets to us. The question is, will we, the five sisters and brothers, see Will we heed the warning before it is too late? In Luke's wonderful imagery, Abraham's bosom waits to enfold us in loving arms, now and after death. And we have that promise from someone who did return from the dead. Amen. Prayers for discernment for both, for all three, myself, 
a potential church and the bishop. So let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you today in gratitude and hope. We pray for these prayers that have been lifted up for you today, for Dodie, who is in the hospital and suffering from infections, for Sharon, who's also in the hospital, for Bruce, and indeed all those who are suffering with cancer, for all the people who are suffering from natural disasters, such as in the Bahamas and Puerto Rico, from all the storms that keep pummeling them. We pray for those people who are struggling to make ends meet, for the family whose dad just lost his job, and so on. And we pray for all those who are victims of traffic accidents. We lift all these names and people to you not just in their specificity, but also in generality. Trusting in you, O oh God, that you will hear the prayers and deal with them as they need. Amen. All of us are blind in one way or another. Some can't see to cross the street, some can't help each other. When I look around, it's not the trouble I see. I see hope and love and wonder, I don't think that it's just me. What I see is all the beauty shining through. Look at me. Tell me, can't you see it too? We can change the world, just believe in what I see. People hurting people, turning a blind eye to simple needs it wouldn't take. Lot to rectify, you see it all the time. And sometimes it's you and me. Still, we get to choose the things we do. One day we all can be what I see. All the I see things that people do They that show their love Others in their lives Never asking very much Things they don't think twice about Just doing what is right There is so much more to see If you open up your eyes What I see all the beauty shining through Look at me I know you can see it too What I see All the beauty shining through Look at me Tell me can't you see it too We can change the world just believe in what I see, what I
set you free So I sat down with the devil I was looking for a better deal He said I'll give you anything but your freedom son And that you're gonna give to me He said I'll give you earthly pleasures I'll give you wealth and fame I'll give you what you ask for But you got to do what I say Because the Lord don't take no prisoners Jesus don't make no deals The Lord don't take no prisoners He just want to set you free shiver I was lying there in my bed I swear I heard a whisper say one day you're gonna wake up dead now if you got to serve one or the other it's got to be the Lord you see cause the devil don't give a damn for you Jesus wanna set you free the Lord don't take no prisoners Jesus Make no deals. The Lord don't take no prisoners. He just want to set you free. The Lord don't take no prisoners. Jesus don't make no deals. The Lord don't take no prisoners. He just want to set you free. He just want to set you free.